My absolute pleasure to welcome you to day two of the Birds and Renewable Energy Forum for 2021. For those of you who joined yesterday, I'm sure you enjoyed uh, the excellent sessions that were presented. We had some wonderful uh, questions that were well answered as well, and uh, really a record attendance for for Baref as well. So we're really excited to see this conversation in this very important space um, continue. So just for those who didn't join, the sessions were recorded yesterday. We had a morning and an afternoon session yesterday, uh, firstly covering environmental policy plans and guidance, and then onto spatial tools to support site selection in the afternoon. I will show you now where you can go and view those recordings if you missed out. Today, we will follow the same format, two sessions. The morning session will cover beyond mitigation, opportunities and challenges for environmental enhancement. And then in the afternoon session, we will be discussing monitoring and mitigation. So in terms of Zoom webinars, uh, the main thing for you to understand is the Q&A box, which you can just see as that red arrow indicates at the bottom of your screen. Once you click on that Q&A, you can ask a question to any of the presenters at any time while the presentations are actually ongoing. We won't be taking live questions from the audience. You can just type your questions there and we will, uh, the presenters will either address them directly to you in an answer or we will discuss them after the presentation in the discussion session after all the sessions have run through. So once again, the recordings will be available on BirdLife South Africa's YouTube channel. This meeting will be recorded, just a disclaimer. So if you wanna see any of the sessions or any of the other content on there, just please click on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel. It will be available there. In terms of the agenda for, for today, just a, quick, just a quick look at this. Welcome everyone again, for those who've just joined us. Um, You've been suitably welcomed by myself. It's Lawrence Luna here from the Endangered Wildlife Trust. I will be uh, in charge of proceedings. In the first session, beyond mitigation, opportunities and challenges for environmental enhancement, we will start off with Anela Kumalu from Conservation Outcomes, uh, chatting about the Greater Crom Stewardship Initiative, followed by Dr. Gareth Tate from the Endangered Wildlife Trust on the Vulture Safe Zones. Very exciting project there. We're looking forward to that. And then we have Rebecca Thomas from Sawia uh, addressing us on opportunities and challenges for additional conservation action and perspective from the wind energy industry. It's always good to have industry present. And then lastly, for the morning session, Samuel Lawrence from Envira Insight talking to us about exploration of the integrated conservation and development model for wind energy facilities in South Africa. As mentioned, these sessions will be then followed by a 15 minute question and answer session and a discussion on some of the questions. And uh, we ask you to please keep your microphones muted and your cameras off. Some of us are in remote places such as the Karoo and the Overberg, and uh, there's not always good connection. So if we can just respect that as well. And yeah, without further ado, then please enjoy uh, the morning session. Sorry guys, we're just running into a glitch with the screen share.
Sorry, guys. I believe there was no sound on that on that recording. It was not coming through on the screen share. Just give us a moment to figure that out. Lawrence, when you click share, just make sure that little box that says share sound in the bottom corner is ticked. Moving along that Jeffreys Bay Coast. My name is Anneli Kumalo, the GKS Conservation Facilitator. Today I'll be presenting you under the theme of Beyond Mitigation, Opportunities and Challenges for Environmental Enhancement and Wind Energy Facilities. In this presentation, I'll touch a number of topics, one being um, introducing what the GKS project is, the purpose and the work that it does, challenges and opportunities, as well as reflecting on the role of renewable energy facilities and their involvement in conservation efforts. So the GKS project is a voluntarily funded project by the five local wind farms in the Koha Kogama region that along with an environmentalist organization by the name of Chrome Enviro Trust came together in 2015 to conceptualize and basically establish what we now know as the GKS project. So the GKS project was established with the main aims of protecting areas with significant biodiversity in this region using the biodiversity stewardship process. So what you see in front of you is basically the map of the GKS project footprint where we do most if not all of our work um, in the Eastern Cape moving along that Jeffreys Bay coastline, St. Francis Bay, Cape St. Francis all the way to your left just before the Tsitsikama National Park and as you can see as well the geographical location of those five wind farms. So the six founding principles of the GKS project are knowledge to improve people's understanding on the importance of protecting critical habitats and biodiversity, two, to protect and create new protected areas using that biodiversity stewardship process, three, land management to ensure the proper land management of those protected areas to maintain the ecological integrity and ensure ecosystem functions still function effectively and funding to be able to access new sources of funding which will enable effective land management sustainability to reduce poverty in the region through supporting entrepreneurs in sustainable green businesses and lastly birds to prioritize bird species that are threatened in this region as we know, one of the negative impacts of wind farms operating is its impact it has on birds. So the GKS project aims to prioritize threatened bird species in this region. So what you see in front of you is a map of the human stop shell Ronosterfeld in this area of the Eastern Cape. Um, this is an original extant map of that habitat now what you see is the remaining remnants of that human stop shell on Osterfeld. So this is actually a great example to illustrate the importance of the work that the GKS project does in that we aim to prioritize habitats such as the human stop shell on Osterfeld that are threatened in this region that have a low protection status and the reasons why a habitat such as the human stop shell or Nostafeld is greatly reduced in size can be attributed to a number of factors. One being um, transformation, which may be due to the dominant land practices in this region, which is your agriculture or your farming land practices, which can also lead to fragmentation of habitats due to those land management practices. So this is just one example of habitats that the GKS project would look to prioritize when we try to secure those areas that do have habitats such as the human stop shell and Osterfeld. So this is just one of many examples of habitats that would look to uh, protect as the GKS project. 
So the biodiversity stewardship process is basically the process whereby the landowner looks to get his land declared as a protected area. So the GKS project takes the landowner throughout that entire process of having their land declared as a protected area. So what you see on the slide in front of you is the four different categories of protected areas, which is your biodiversity partnership area, biodiversity agreement, protected environment, and your nature reserve. So when you go from the bottom up of that chart, it basically um, stipulates a higher protection status, the higher you go up with the chart. And depending on the assessment and the criteria of that specific land, a landowner may qualify for one of those four protected area categories. So throughout the six years of the GKS has been existing, we have been able to secure and protect sites with valuable habitats and critical biodiversity. So this is a map of um, the protected areas that the GKS has been involved in to try and secure over the years. And you can clearly see there's a quite a prominent grouping of protected areas on your bottom right corner of the map along your San Francis Bay and Cape St. Francis area. Um, as the GKS project, we're quite cognizant of not only just trying to get protected areas declared as in isolations or as protected area islands, but we also look to see if can we create a network in a specific landscape of protected areas. So we try to get a good cluster of protected areas in a certain landscape just to ensure um, that there are ecological corridors that are created by having a network of protected areas. So this is just one way of um, trying to get areas declared to not just have them declared as islands or in isolation, but look to see if you can create a network or a band of protected areas in a specific landscape. So once the landowner has gone through that entire process of having their land um, declared as a protected area, the GKS also provides uh, post-declaration support for the landowner. So this could be, as you see on the slide, providing signage for the landowner for their protected area or drafting of management plans as well. And throughout our work in this region, we've been fortunate enough to establish working relationships with existing local conservation organizations. And we've seen the importance of collaborative work in this region to be able, <coughs> excuse me, to share resources and knowledge um, in the work that you do with organizations that share similar objectives and goals and have um, a footprint in the region when it comes to conservation work. So we've been, it's one of, I believe, our success stories in this landscape, creating those relationships with other organizations and stakeholders. So um, the challenges of um, renewable energy sectors um, in the conservation realm, I believe, is um, that the renewable energy companies tend to operate as corporate entities with specific objectives and bottom lines, which may not necessarily be in alignment with the objectives of environmental issues. So what I believe that it creates blind spots in their understanding or perspective of environmental issues and their importance. And this could possibly lead to a much more cautious approach in those um, renewable energy companies and trying to get involved in conservation efforts in any specific region. But I believe that there's also great opportunities to overcome those reservations or that cautious mindset that they may have. One of them is not only just looking to put in place mitigation efforts in their impacted species in their operation as a wind farm, but look to have a much more positive gain of impacted species. And one great example is an article I read recently on avant-grid renewables in the United States, where 
in their operations as a wind energy company, they've discovered that they have a great and significant impact on the California condo, which is the largest flying bird in North America. So they decided to try and play a much more active role or much more positive role on those impacted species. So they financed the breeding project for birds in captivity to look to replace birds impacted by the wind farms of their company. So they anticipate to produce over six condos throughout the three year period where they are financing this breeding project. So this is just one example of wind energy companies not only implementing mitigation measures, but also looking to, to make a much more positive impact on those species that they are negatively impacting in their operation. And another opportunity I believe they could explore is collaborative work, which I mentioned earlier on, looking to work with local organizations in a specific region that already has a pre-existing footprint in that area that has done significant conservation work in that area, as this may allow the closure of that knowledge gap that they may have as wind energy companies if they align themselves with organizations that do do that environmental or conservation work in that specific area. And as a reflection as the GKS of our six years working in this landscape, one of our lessons that we believe we've gained is understanding the importance of securing critical biodiversity. I use the example of the human dog shell rhinocephal, but countrywide there's numerous habitats that are fragmented, that are highly transformed, that need to be protected and conserved for future as well, as well as creating networks of protected area and not just islands of protected area is very critical in the conservation efforts. Creating awareness of the importance of those surrounding habitats as well. Cultivating relationships with local stakeholders, creating those synergies, creating those working environments and relationships is critical. And lastly, I believe the GKS project can be seen as an example of renewable energy companies making a positive environmental impact as well as leaving a lasting legacy in regions that they operate in. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to present to you today. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Gareth Tate. I manage the Birds of Prey program at the Endangered Wildlife Trust. Today I'm going to be talking about the origin and context of vulture safe zones. And more importantly, I'm going to be discussing our specific success and impact that we've achieved through the application and establishment of vulture safe zones across Southern Africa. And then of course, talking about their relevance within the renewable energy sector and looking at the opportunities that they provide for environmental enhancement. The vulture safe zone concept arises from the multi-species action plan for vultures and one of the key actions identified within this plan was the need to develop vulture safe zone criteria and then promote its rollout across 128 states across Africa, Asia and Europe for 15 old world vulture species. Vulture safe zones were originally implemented in South Asia at the height of the Asian vulture crisis. Here, many countries, India in particular, experienced rapid vulture population declines of over 90% in some populations. And this was driven by diclofenac poisoning. Diclofenac is an, an anti-inflammatory veterinary drug that's used to treat livestock, in particular cattle in Asia. And this drug was found to be incredibly toxic to vultures. It causes renal failure in raptors. And so vultures that were feeding on, on the abundant carcasses of livestock that were treated with diclofenac quickly succumbed to the highly toxic drug. Vultures were literally falling out of the sky and dying on their perches. And so the primary focus of these vulture safe zones was to address the major threat of diclofenac, as well as other NSAIDs. They were pioneered in Nepal and ultimately implemented in four countries altogether, including India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And this comprised of about 12 vulture safe zones in total. The criteria developed for these vulture safe zones were put together by the Saving Asia's Vultures from Extinction Consortium or SAVE Consortium. And one of the biggest criteria, of course, was the banning of the use of diclofenac, which saw the 
immediate recovery and stabilization of populations and was also ind indicative of how well this collaborative approach and the application of vulture safe zones in this context were, were highly effective. Bangladesh has afforded legal status to vulture safe zones, which is an incredibly important aspect in, in terms of getting government support and endorsement for, for vulture safe zones, which we'll talk about a bit later. The success of vulture safe zones in Asia certainly paved the way forward for the application here in Southern Africa. However, we really had to take a step back and, and look at the concept through an entirely new African lens. And some of the more important factors to consider when thinking about the application of vulture safe zones in, in a Southern African context uh, are, of course, the geography and the size of the region. It's an incredibly large area. If you look at the SADC, the South African Development Countries, it's, a, it's substantially larger than the area of interest in, in Asia where, where diclofenac was driving the vulture population declines. And then as you move from one area to the next, it's an incredibly dynamic threat landscape and it's a complex suite of threats that we need to consider. We're dealing with communities, we're dealing with poisoning, um, collisions and electrocutions and energy infrastructure and a variety of threats uh, that we need to consider. And then, of course, the spatial ecology of our resident vulture species and the incredibly large home range size of most of our sub-Saharan species, our gyps species in particular. So the white back vultures and cape vulture have incredibly large home ranges and dispersal ranges of, of well in excess of 25,000 square kilometers. So that's a, a big challenge. And then, of course, is there a one size fits all solution of criteria to apply that will be appropriate when considering the above? And then we're looking at research foundation conference Apologies, everyone. We seem to just be having some technical issues. We'll get the presentation back up and running in just a moment. Please bear with us. Hi, everybody. Um, it looks like we have lost our chair. Um, so I'm going to just step in a little bit. Um, bear, bear with us. Um, but while we are, are waiting for, for the video to get up and running, I thought maybe we could um, address some of the, the, the questions that are, are raised. Um, one of the, the, the questions was um, that it, it seems as though there might be an opportunity for increased data collection um, on and around wind farms through citizen science. Um, this is directed at the Lele, related to um, your awareness raising efforts. Is iNaturalist a, a good platform um, to use? And, and perhaps Anele could, could help with that. Uh, thank you, Sam. Um, it is correct that there's always a need for a collection of more data in and around the natural environment, more specifically in areas when you take into the context of the Kohan, the Kogama region, where we have a lot of fragmentation and transformation and that any data collected in that region could be of great value. And one of the easiest ways, so to speak, would be through citizen science. And it's it creates that awareness. It allows for your normal um, people in, in, in the communities to identify those species, create that database of um, species that they are found in and around their region. So there's always um, a great opportunity to tap into increased data collection and especially when you use an effective tool such as 
iNaturalist. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to check in to see whether we can um, carry on with that presentation. Gareth, from, from your side, are you, you ready to load again? Yes, Sam. Um, Lawrence disappeared, so I will quickly share my screen and, and, and hold thumbs that it works. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Sorry, everybody, please bear with us. It seems to be a, a day of technical gremlins. We were um, amazed how well everything ran yesterday, but it, it seems not today. Um, just give us a, a few seconds, please. My name is Anil Kumar. The above and then also looking at vulture safe zones versus vulture strongholds will vulture safe zones capture these really important breeding and foraging sites for vultures what really caught my attention when thinking about bringing vulture safe zones home here to southern africa and about applying them within a very unique african context was a presentation put together by the nsap consortium at the raptor research foundation conference in 2018 and their presentation and poster really effectively summarized the, the safe spaces and the habitat strongholds, including really vital breeding and foraging space for our resident vulture species. But they also looked at the predominant threats that overlap with these spaces and also looking at where there was also significant overlap between different species. So where these strongholds overlap. And this really got me thinking about the approach we need to take when thinking about where we need to establish vulture safe zones and whether they'll be effective or not. This thought process led to the setting up of a really important meeting with a handful of specialists and, and key stakeholders to start thinking about and developing the definitions and, and criteria for vulture safe zones that are relevant within an African context. And so we defined a vulture safe zone as an appropriately sized geographic area where targeted conservation measures are undertaken to address the key threats relevant to the vulture species present and to sustain viable wild populations. Vulture safe zones are developed in Southern Africa to complement national and international efforts to reduce the impact of existing and emerging threats, to stabilize and promote recovery of existing vulture populations. Along with this, we also developed a set of criteria in order for properties to achieve vulture safe zone status in the essence of time, I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can find these on our website. And that, of course, leads us to the very important approach and process that we take to identify vulture safe zones. And as you can see, we take a very multi-pronged approach, looking at the different species biology, looking at where they breed and where they forage, 
as well as looking at different distribution modeling to identify really core sites. And then very importantly is to look at where threats overlap with these core sites. We don't want to establish vulture safe zones in an area where there aren't any pertinent threats uh, present. So the threat landscape is a very important one and also threats that we are able to address. It's important to note that vulture safe zones are geared to reduce declines and to reduce the level of threat. We can't always guarantee that we're going to 100% mitigate the threat and that that's a really important step in the process of, of understanding vulture safe zones. But then also looking at the, the community and landowner landscape, it's, it's really important that we leverage support from willing landowners. Um, some areas it's very tough and challenging to work with, with landowners and properties, um, even on, on state land. So you've also got to consider that when you're looking at sites to develop your vulture safe zones. And then also ranking your threats, looking at the interventions that will be effective for your threats. And then obviously we need to think about the networks that we need to establish in terms of implementing partners and then obviously endorsement from government, which is why we are convening the entire Vulture Safe Zone concept and approach and initiative through the National Vulture Task Force. Find vulture safe zones, we use GPS tracking. In this case, we have data from five different African vulture species from 112 individuals comprising of about 1.2 million GPS fixes. And this has allowed us to really identify the areas that the species rely on, where they forage and where they breed. Furthermore, the EWT has a really important nest monitoring data set across Southern Africa that we use to guide and help us to identify vulture safe zones. We of course want to capture as much breeding habitat within our vulture safe zones. Breeding pairs are essentially seen as the currency of a population. And so we do need to focus on incorporating these within our vulture safe zones, and particularly um, outside of protected areas. These processes have led us to the identification of our flagship vulture safe zones across Southern Africa. Really importantly, these are run in collaboration and partnership with a variety of stakeholders in particular in areas where our vulture safe zones span across international boundaries. The next steps and certainly a more exciting aspect of our vulture safe zone process are the on the ground activities we undertake to formally establish a vulture safe zone. This is effectively broken down into two phases. During the first phase we undertake a comprehensive site assessments to improve our understanding of the landscape we're working in. It's here when we start really engaging with landowners and developing important relationships and support from these landowners, one of the most vital parts of our work. In this phase, through our site assessments and engagements, we start to develop a really intimate understanding and map of the threat landscape. And this plays a really vital role in informing the second phase of our work. Once a site assessment has been completed, a report is sent by the EWT to the property management or the owners, outlining all existing threat, mitigation options and other aspects that need consideration for the property to qualify as a vulture safe zone. In consultation with the property management or the owners, a timeline is then developed to implement all measures needed to address the key threats to vultures on the property. And this leads to the more direct hands-on component of the project where we start actively mitigating threats on the properties. Really importantly, we work with the landowners, we develop new solutions that work for them too. And then of course, a really important component of this work is to create awareness across the entire landscape. We're really excited to announce some of the mitigation options that include our very own drone project where we can fit bird flappers and bird diverters on power lines to reduce collisions on power lines and then obviously we have a very important strategic partnership with ESCOM to facilitate the safe proofing of unsafe electrical infrastructure. Importantly within our vulture safe zone sites and through our engagements with landowners we facilitate and endorse the reporting of power line incidents and this has seen a tenfold reporting rate within some of the sites that we've been working in. A really important part of mitigating these unsafe power lines and energy infrastructure. We've also had really rewarding engagements with hunting and culling operators across our vulture safe zone sites to start phasing out the use of leaded ammunition, offering important information around lead's toxicity to vultures, scavengers and people too, and also discussing lead-free ammunition alternatives. And to also look at what veterinary drugs are wrapped as safe. 
With escalating energy demands across South Africa and a rising desire for cleaner energy, we acknowledge the need to work with renewable energy developers to ensure the construction of environmentally friendly wind energy facilities, to enhance conservation in and around wind energy facilities, and to develop effective measures to significantly reduce and prevent fatalities and disturbance on both operational and planned wind energy facilities. We have subsequently partnered with a handful of key developers and stakeholders within South Africa to develop vulture safe zones in and around both operational and proposed wind energy facilities. Not only working with them to address the immediate cumulative threat of wind energy on collision prone raptors and birds, but to also start working on long term projects to reduce the key threats to vultures through the establishment of vulture safe zones. In closing, I'd like to summarize what we feel makes vulture safe zones so effective in Southern Africa. The first is being able to package multiple conservation interventions into one initiative, allowing us to address multiple threats across a really challenging threat landscape. Our projects also have a long term vision of 10 years plus, and this allows us to maintain a conservation presence within a given landscape. We are also able to develop really intimate and important relationship with landowners. Our work is also guided by the Multi Species Action Plan and developed under the conservation standard, allowing us to measure our impact and also develop really important and useful indicators for our work. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. I look forward to your questions and engagements, and I really would like to thank our partners and our sponsors for the project. Can you imagine an Africa without vultures? We cannot. Good morning again. I'm going to skip the introductions this time, but in short, Rebecca um, representing South African Wind Energy Association. Today's presentation, we're really looking at um, the, well, from a SOWEA perspective, the opportunities and challenges for additional conservation action. So sort of what can be done over and beyond um, your typical uh, mitigation measures, uh, your legislated mitigation measures, what can IPPs, what can renewable energy developers do that has a greater sort of outlook towards conservation. So I'm really going to keep the presentation short today. Um, in essence, the presentation structure will cover, I'm just going to give a couple of examples of current conservation initiatives that are in place and that sort of serve um, conservation efforts uh, for the greater benefit of, of ecology, etc., beyond birds and bats, more for yeah, the greater ecology. Um, with that, I'm going to propose what I believe is the problem. Uh, that being said, um, just a dis you know, disclaimer that the presentation has been discussed with several members of SOWEA. Um, so in essence, what, let me put it this way, what we believe is the problem. Um, and what we as an industry feel could be the direction of potential solutions, what we should be looking at, um, future considerations, um, and how, which I'll discuss in a bit more detail, how we move from a reactive conservation state to a more proactive conservation state. And then I have a couple of questions which I'm putting out there for discussion. Um, and we actually felt this set, this um, presentation would more lend itself to a larger discussion. And I guess the questions we're posing are what we're hoping will start that larger discussion and maybe evolve into a much larger, bigger um, discussion later on. So just to start with, um, a couple of current conservation initiatives that uh, a couple of renewable energy IPP developers have in place. Um, we have the likes of rehabilitation trusts. So in essence, where you make funds available based on the footprint of the ecology or biodiversity that is going to be impacted. Um, you you set aside a rehabilitation trust. Um, I've put in the picture here, example, Renew Karoo. So, for instance, I know they do a lot of work in the Northern Cape, where particularly the Karoo we know is slow-growing vegetation. Any disruption takes years to recover. 
So there are a couple of rehabilitation trusts where you get Renew Career in. They essentially assess the value or worth um, or what it's going to essentially cost to rehabilitate the amount of land lost. Um, and what you do is you put that upfront essential value into a trust. You agree who manages the trust. Obviously, you want that done by some sort of uh, ecological body. Um, and that, that money or that funds gets managed over the life of the project. So at the point of decommissioning or at the point where rehabilitation is needed, then the funds become available and the rehabilitation tank can take place. Um, the other sort of more common initiative is biodiversity offset agreements. Um, essentially, if you look at the picture in the bottom left hand corner, what a biodiversity offset is, where you are losing on one side, you essentially um, recreate or you, you um, sort of grow um, on the other side. So where the project is, there may be a net loss. But for instance, you identify a potential area which could serve as an ecological um, growth point and you invest into that area and ensure that that um, the amount or value of the ecology lost on your site is essentially restored or enhanced or conserved on another site, either equal to, but often more so um, greater than the loss on the site. And at the end of the day, you sit with a no net loss. Um, we all aware biodiversity offsets do sit in the um, mitigation hierarchy. Um, but it is a method that is being used currently by IPPs. Then another, uh, another initiative is funding of new research. So areas of um, uncertainty uh, where there's not a lot of data available. Um, I'm going to use um, bird examples here, but like the likes of the rose eagle, um, the red larks, where at the time of developing certain projects, the data or research about the species is, you know, still a fairly early stage. Um, and what you can do is where there may be an impact, then the IPP would fund, you know, um, further research into that impact so that it can be better understood later on. Um, the fourth example I've given here is the Greater Cromer Stewardship Initiative. I'm not going to talk about this because I do see um, the presenter, I think is after me, is presenting on this. But just, yeah, and they'll go into greater detail about that. But where IPPs can come together and also put funds into um, initiatives such as this for the greater benefit of the environment. So these are examples of sort of what have been done. Um, and on that, I'm going to suggest what, what some of the industry believes is the problem. Um, and again, this is very much a presentation for debate and discussion. But how it seems, particularly I think on both sides, both the um, conservation side as well as the IPP side, is a lot of conservation in it initiatives are predominantly reactive as opposed to proactive. So you generally find um, the IPPs will put in place or go or put in place those initiatives I've just dis discussed when there is high pressure from non-government organizations, when it is particularly required as part of a piece of legislation, when um, there's no incentivization to consider um, outside the reactive realm and also responding to site specific issues instead of considering the bigger picture. So in, in that example, at the wind farm, um, less case maybe at the solar farm, there is a river iron rabbit issue, there is a burrows eagle issue and then you specifically zone in and try and place your efforts on that issue, but potentially not very effective efforts. Um, 
and and you're doing that because that's where the pressure is that's that's the red flag so that is what you're addressing whereas you could possibly have a greater benefit if you took a step back looked at the bigger picture and put your efforts elsewhere so we move then from then into the solution and a couple of solutions which are proposed or let's say under consideration um, amongst various IPPs or renewable energy developers at the moment um, there's there's discussion around um, sort of formalizing conservation commitments so similar to the ED SED commitments that you find in a lot of uh, requests for proposals or tender documents um, those are set out as very strict minimum requirements you have to meet the targets in order to you know proceed to um, price evaluation and is there an opportunity for similar conservation commitments um, another consideration is for alternative direct benefits so I explained previously the focus is then on the actual impact on the site if you take a step back there could be far more simple effective initiatives addressing larger root causes such as offsets to direct um, renewable energy impacts uh, for instance and I know a couple of IPPs have also done this um, donating or at least um, contributing to bird diverters on more problematic transmission lines not near the project not on the project but elsewhere in the country where it is known those transmission lines are having large effects on bird collisions or electrocutions um, and saying again like an offset there's going to be a loss on our site but can we reduce or make it a net zero loss by um, putting by dirt, bird diverters elsewhere um, I'm throwing this one in there but the likes of vulture restaurants already in no-go renewable energy zones if there is a clear no-go renewable energy zone and there's a potential to put for instance a vulture restaurant is you know is that an initiative or mitigation measure that could be considered where you have very high resources um, in other areas where we know the vulture colonies are um, and moving them away I know this is going to um, bring about a lot of debate it's just questions we thought worth asking um, then the last one I see it's the I is missing there but AI or artificial intelligence so um, most of us are familiar with the likes of identity flight um, also the radar uh, I think there's DT birds or DT bird identification but um, essentially putting in effort into the likes of digitization or artificial intelligence which removes the human factor um, along with that comes also health and safety um, reduction in risks um, by removing the human element you're also reducing the risks of people being on site having to physically do the the watches or do the shutdowns on demands um, and is it not an opportunity for IPPs or developers to invest into this artificial artificial intelligence and improve these technologies um, and linking them to automated shutdowns on demand etc um, then lastly more proactive conservation incentives so for instance if a developer proposing let's say a project in a, um, a medium sensitive area and they present a solution as I say it might not be a direct solution but it might be a new solution it might be an innovative solution it might be an effective solution elsewhere and by doing so um, you know potentially receive a benefit or or even on site 
if you can provide some sort of conservation solution on site um, that is for the benefit of greater conservation, um, while there are, we know, impacts, um, and again, almost sort of a uh, weighing of the, the net loss. Um, so these are essentially going to lead into the questions I have on the next slide. Um, these, are, these are some of the topics that I know the developers are discussing at the moment. And I think it's a good opportunity, particularly in this forum, to pose it with, with the ecologists, with the non-government organizations, with the developers on the call. Um, and see, you know, if we can start to head in a direction that everyone thinks um, has a sustainable outcome for the industry. So I, with that, I give the questions for discussion. Um, I understand this might be after some of the other um, presentations, but we can always flip back to the slide if needs be. But yeah, first one, how best do we motivate the move from reactive conservation to actually cultivate proactive willingness? Um, I think the willingness is there. A lot of us um, have the willingness, but at the moment, we're not seeing the benefits of applying the willingness. Um, and it's not always to say there needs to be a benefit, but, um, you know, there is... There are other aspects at play and, you know, how do we cultivate that willingness so that it becomes the norm? Um, another question I have is, is incentivization just another reactive mechanism though? Is it a case of, as I sort of alluded to in the first question, well, now we get a benefit, so, you know, let's propose a solution. I think that we need to interrogate a bit further. Then EDSED, EDSED commitments I spoke about are solidified in a lot of the request for proposals or the tender documents, both the REAP program as well as um, private offtake RFPs. Um, it's already there. It's already a percentage um, you know, of, of the commercial numbers. Potentially, is there an opportunity to even allocate a percentage of the EDSED commitments to conservation? That way, also ensuring that conservation is incorporated and entrenched in the communities going forward. So you're essentially ticking your EDSED box, and at the same time, you're promoting and motivating, or you need, conservation efforts to form part of that EDSED um, component. Then just would like to hear from the specialists out there. Are you aware of any other um, initiatives or conservation practices that you know of other developers, not even necessarily renewable energy developers, other developers that could potentially be, you know, suggested to the renewable energy industry? Um, and yeah, so what are others doing? What are other ideas? Not necessarily what are others doing? What have others thought about? Um, and essentially, I'm going to end with the statement of let's take this discussion or use this presentation as a start of the discussion, taking it to the next level and hopefully inspiring some creative sustainability thinking, not just because it's required, but because we actually have the opportunity to and want to and can make a difference. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for allowing us to present on this forum. My name is Sam Lawrence. I'm a professional ranger as well as a SACNAS registered zoologist and ecologist. And I'll be exploring the integrated conservation and development models for wind energy facilities in South Africa. Essentially, this presentation discusses our novel approach to integrating ICDPs under sort of an adaptive model. Uh, when I say novel, I mean none of the concepts in themselves are very new, but we are cobbling together 
various concepts that have been applied successfully in South Africa in order to deal with the green versus green interactions under a development framework, which is slightly unusual in wind energy, but not as unusual as it might be thought in terms of other development, uh, as well as unpacking some of the development conservation and financial services that can apply uh, and how they have significant benefits in terms of management costs and desired outcomes. Just a brief history of EnviroInsight, myself on the left with a pangolin and Luke on the right with a snake as he usually is found. We started the company in 2009 and are still going strong. Essentially our vision, we, we see four pillars in terms of the application of this model and we firmly believe that the green revolution has begun. And what I mean by that is that these 10 years have been postulated as the time when the earth is at five seconds to midnight and something must be done in regards to the arresting of climate change and the extinction of biodiversity. And one of those is to hold development accountable, meaning that conservation should be integrated within a development framework. And how to do that is based on these four pillars being legal, the EIA process, which is now in its 52nd year on earth, uh, the use of technology and community and conservation. The legal is under NEMPA, which is a slightly unusual governance layer, but is well applied uh, throughout the country for protected areas, uh, the National Environmental Management of Protected Areas Act. NEMA, we're all familiar with. Uh, technology is incredibly important. I've just returned from Europe where I've seen the latest application of technology uh, in the monitoring and management of bird interactions, bird wind energy interactions, and community and conservation, which is the unpacking of how stakeholders can be employed within these frameworks. We suggest that the whole model is employed within a public-private partnership, given that the ratification of protected areas is a public legal st uh, structure. Never far from our thoughts. Who will pay? It is incredibly important to understand that a lot of these concepts require significant funding and we must be con conscious of these all throughout our application of the model. So, the protected area model. This is a comparative analysis between Mozambique and South Africa. Now, basically Mozambique has got 17% of its country listed as a protected area and a far greater square kilometrage than South Africa. But those are divided into 53 registered protected areas, which is a very, very small number and often gives rise to that famous term of paper park. However, in South Africa, our protected areas are divided up within 1,043 protected areas. I believe the number is now greater, showing that the model can actually be applied strongly and has been applied very often. Uh, we, we see this as an important legislative point, given that, that our constitution is very strong and done correctly, it can be applied uh, on, a, on an effective basis. And we want to highlight this point as we as we pursue this within a development framework. Choosing a project is all important. The qualification factors basically revolve, revolve around integrating laws, guidelines, norms and standards. This is a classic CBA map uh, of an arbitrary area in Limpopo. Uh, I've chosen this because it doesn't affect any uh, non-disclosure agreements that I might have, but it is a project I'm currently working on for something else. What you see is various farm portions that have been delineated based on their CBA importance, uh, their critical biodiversity area importance, and what should drive the selection criteria of both a development and a protected area is these, this protected status for the, the CBAs within the EIA framework guide basically where one should apply development, but also it'll guide where one can qualify a protected area. 
given that the higher the CBA value, the more likely it is to warrant protected area status. Essentially, the baselines, again, are all important, and I would like to point to the case study in Kenya, where a 100 megawatt WEF has actually been notified as a protected area, and it's worth pursuing uh, this knowledge, given that what I'm saying is not completely unique in a worldwide capacity. The protected area model is, is fairly simple. Um, I've shown the most simple path to, to actual success. These have got their own legislative, well not legislative, legal agreements. The, the private nature reserve model can be split up into communal lands or community land can actual, actually apply, as well as single land ownerships. Stewardships are more of a non-binding agreement structure, while a provincial nature reserve is actually managed by the government. This is incredibly important, given that it shows the, both a contractual length of time, as well as the legislation that needs to be applied regarding the status of the protected area. You'll notice that a nature reserve is just below a national park and can be applied to private lands. Now, how it works is that landowners can actually keep their, their title deeds. And what happens is that a, 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 a attachment or a note is given to their title deed based on the contract. And this talks to a management plan, which basically acts as the constitution. So if someone registers their, their land as a protected area, they can't build an airport, but they can still utilize their land within, a, within the framework of, of a protected area. So even hunting and farming to some extent or game farming will be allowed, but activities that are not within the, within the framework of NEMPA uh, will, be, will be disallowed. It also protects the, the land against other development. So where wind farms and other developers that are seeking to buffer their lands can be in the interest to 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 assist landowners to to ratify the areas but what is very important is that it provides a governance layer which allows for financial financial investment to have confidence that the contracts will, will be honored and the funding is incredibly important to, to note as we move forward in the in the process this is just a case study a horses for courses approach showing the various applications you know replay nature reserve is one example um, where a protected area surrounds a, a national point of interest uh, given a, it's, a, it's a water source uh, and and these these examples are worth pursuing just as a as a way of understanding how the, the NEMPA act can be pro, uh, can be provided moving along Stakeholders, I'm not going to read them all to you, but it's incredibly important to identify the stakeholders, given that um, the public and the private sectors must be participating in this, and negative and positive impacts will come from all stakeholders, so one must identify those and be able to mitigate them under the application of this model. Another question is why? Why anybody would do this? Especially a developer because basically the process can be quite expensive and, and, and ongoing but then again so is the pre-construction monitoring process so there are a lot of benefits for both developers and landowners and public private sectors to to participate in this and i will be providing some more examples as we go through but, but essentially, all of these, these tick boxes are within the framework of a protected area and why a protected area sh exists and, and, should be, and should be brought forward to, to execute these line items. Again, this issue will never go away. Who will pay? Application of technology. We're all very familiar with the application of technology conceptually for the mitigation of bird in impacts. These are some of the examples I've received from France, uh, being radar for long range detection, 
the AI artificial intelligence com combinations as an integrated system and also the, ca the AI cameras for short range detection. Uh, I'll be speaking to you all regarding what I found in France um, at, at your earliest convenience, but I can tell you that what is incredibly important about technology that it, is that it can be applied to monitor the metrics that are required to prove positive impact through the ratification of protected areas, meaning that the technology that is applied and costs a lot of money to stop birds colliding with wind facilities can also be used to generate income by proving on decentralized finance systems that the data is correct and transparent and is working. Of course, telemetry is very important. Here's a plug for the EWT. Thank you, Gareth. And tracking individual rare and endangered species are, are very, is a very important part of this and should be funded appropriately. Again, the tab keeps going up. All of the stuff costs a lot of money and somebody has to cover the bill. Usually, human wildlife interaction is represented by some of the pictures that we see to the left, snake bites and bush meat and elephant crop raiding. But in our world, it is important to understand that green on green conflicts are often revolving around the bird and the birds we love losing the battle. Here's a picture on the left of the famous Camus solar system and a Ludwig Bustard basically flying into it, as well as on the right, these tiny little Ludwig Bustards flying exactly at rotor height. I've spoken about the stakeholders and how important they are. We all have a part to play within this model and it is important to understand that a lot of these parts represent jobs and jobs for communities, jobs for people, jobs for the NGOs, jobs for scientists and university graduates, and also benefits for land landholders. Essentially, we want to develop a new ethic where our first thoughts are basically, how can we work together to apply these measures, as well as how can we use a protected area for our advantage to both generate funding and to to tick the boxes that are required for mitigation of impacts especially the green on green impacts and this is, requires a, a change in a mindset where we stop host, uh, we stop hostilities to some respect um, especially between us as specialists and some landholders that maybe want wind facilities because of the, the financial benefits. Um, and we start working together and explaining to landholders how they can benefit from ratifying their land. This is a simple slide which shows how infrastructure and conservation can interact to create success in the model between NEMA and NEMPA because and the IDPs, this is a direct quote from the WWF, and you're free to, re to read the, the, the principles of uh, ICDPs um, and the application thereof. So once again, we get to the, the bill, and this is very important given that these are linked to protected areas, but the sharing of benefits becomes all important. And this is where the rubber hits the road in terms of both financing and the benefits that are generated from the actual application of the model. So we get to the end. Here are a list of some direct benefits. Uh, how, how would a developer actually obtain benefits from, uh, from protecting areas? Uh, including taxations and preferential rates on lenders uh, from lenders all the way through to this new wave of decentralized finance coming coming through on blockchains and all these fancy tokens that people don't fully understand but essentially represent a strong way of the future in the sense that money can bypass the usual regulations and get straight to the projects that they needed to actually make a difference and this is where 
people that actually understand both worlds on the ground and at the top of the financing become quite powerful in, in driving this kind, these kinds of projects to be able to see on the ground change. And everybody really has to change their mindset as to how to apply these principles. Here's just a list of benefits which we all are aware of. These are the, the, the nice, to, to, not just the nice to have, but the needs to have in, in the new world. The broad process in terms of the financing is that impacts are identified and the verification system runs down the chain. What is very important here is that transparency is something that, that NGO based donor funding is not famous for, especially in Africa. And, and people want to know where their money is going and they want to be able to prove positive impact. And once again, I refer back to the technology. So this is incredibly important to understand and take note of because there is a new wave of financing that can be brought to bear. And I will continue this down the line next year as we all work together for better outcomes. Thank you and any questions. All right. Thank you for that. Thanks, Gareth, for jumping in to save the day with a, with a screen share because the internet completely dropped on my side. So apologies for that, everyone. And thanks for sticking with us. I see no one has left. So all the participants are still here. That couldn't have been that bad. Um, great. So we've got some time for questions. Um, let's see what we've got. We've got loads of questions. I'm just going to cherry pick uh, what we can see here. Uh, this one, I think, is for Gareth on the Vulture Safe Zone project. It's from uh, Marianne de Villiers. She says, congratulations on the Vulture Safe Zone project. What is your impression of landowner attitudes to vulture conservation? And have you seen a change since your first engagements with them? Have you been tracking this in some way? Thanks, Marianne. Yes, uh, it's a great, great question. And, and certainly, on in, generally speaking, we've seen an encouraging feedback and, and movement from landowners to support the work. In fact, in some of our water safe zones, they're, they're fundamentally driven by the landowners themselves. And we have been tracking this uh, during the, the entire site assessment phase and starting to map it within each water safe zone. So a lot of our properties kind of start off as a, as a red shape file. And as we start mitigating the threats, they start off as provisional water safe zones. We slowly mitigate the threats. And as I mentioned in my presentation, have a long-term vision to, to phase out all the threats and to work with the landowners to, to mitigate and manage their properties in, in vulture-friendly manners. So it certainly are seeing an encouraging uptake from, from landowners. And I think we've engaged with over 350 uh, uh, individual farmers and, and landowners uh, since we started in 2019. And at many of our presentations and, and stakeholder engagement meetings, we often have landowners approaching us. So it certainly is being driven from the landowners and this is one of the more encouraging and, and parts of the project that really make us enthusiastic about the, the work. So yeah, so we, we are mapping it out and, and measuring it as we go and uh, one of our indicators is the, the, the size of the properties committed to becoming vulture safe. So we're seeing um, a steady incline in, across Southern Africa with all the landowners buying into the process and, and actually formally committing to the process. So, yeah. Thanks, Gareth, that comprehensive answer. Right, we'll move straight to a question from John Smalley. Uh, John, uh, this question is for Rebecca. Rebecca, if you're online, you just have your camera on as well. Um, John says, Rebecca, could you comment on the significant drop in tariff over five rounds and how this will squeeze the environment? I suspect environmental considerations will come under more pressure. As an example, I've already seen a renewed interest by developers in putting internal power lines above ground again to save money. You get that? I, I got that. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, it's yeah, a good question, I guess. Um, so I did explain yesterday, John, that um, 
and again, it's it's often hard to answer these questions when you when we have this green, you know, green for green um, sort of discussion. Um, the tariffs are reducing. They're reducing due to efficiencies in technology. Um, they're reducing due to longer term thinking. Um, in short, that historically uh, renewable energy facilities were seen as 20 year assets or at least modeled as such. Um, the industry doesn't see that as the case and sees them as longer term assets, you know, extending beyond the 20 year um, PPA terms, et cetera. So in that respect, yeah, there, there is additional um, revenues to be to be taken and therefore reducing the tariff. Why we're reducing the tariff is obviously to get the energy cheaper to the customer um, and essentially or essentially cheaper to Eskom currently um, before we start rolling out the, the electricity or, or energy to private customers. Um, and and I guess that's sort of why, and and I, I would love to hear Libby add on this, but why we I particularly posed the question, or we posing the question of um, building it in with EDACD commitments. EDACD commitments are are quite stock standard. They're they're pretty set in the various tender documents, requests for proposals. Um, so you know if there's a way to get them involved there or at least form a small percentage or at least a percentage rather of the EDSED and sort of tie them both together, I think we can continue conservation efforts. Um, and to be honest, I think as we, as the industry matures even further, I think it's still quite a young industry. Um, and as with any other industry that matures, you I don't believe you can neglect your commitments to conservation efforts. I think the more the industry matures, the more visible it becomes, and actually the more you're going to have to um, put put into conservation efforts. Um, and you're just going to have to find your way around that. In short, I, unfortunately, I don't have you know the answer completely. I'm just giving you my opinion here. Um, and I think the industry is is very eager to to find solutions because you know we're having these discussions every year, so um, it's not like they're going to disappear. And um, and that's why, as a unit or as as you know, this particular forums is where we need to have these discussions and figure out what is going to be this sustainable approach that everyone can get on the same page about. Thanks, Rebecca, for that. Yeah, I mean, as you say, I think it is quite a, it's quite a tricky situation. And, and um, John also knows how difficult it is. I think we're just sparking the discussion and but more to the point of um, the power lines going above ground. I mean, obviously, we've seen that where additional uh, reticulation lines are above ground, in some cases, the impact is more um, than the actual turbines. We see this um, even at ESCOM's wind facility, where um, the, the line linking the power station, uh, the, the substation to the, to the wind farm is actually causing more fatalities than the actual turbines. So, and, and I think we can still achieve a balance. It's just about how those lines are designed. Um, you know, that, that line engineers should not just take into account the, um, the design of the structure in terms of the voltage and in terms of the terrain and the topography, but they do need to consider what, what, um, what wildlife um, are present in that area. And if the structure is properly designed, you could have a massive reduction in mortalities. And as usual, um, we're happy as the EWT to discuss those factors if it can't be avoided. So feel free to reach out to us again. But thanks uh, for all the great work and thanks for the response. Right. I'm going to go to, a, to another question here. Well, I see it's already been answered. Um, but I think it, it, it's quite an interesting one. So we will highlight it again because we still have a little bit of time for, for the benefit of everyone. Lindsay Smith is asking or is saying uh, to Samuel, 
Samuel, thank you for your very thought-provoking presentation. I may have missed if you discussed this, but is there any overlap or synergies between the ICDP model and the OECM concept as recognized under the CBD? Samuel, are you um, happy to answer that? Yeah. Um, yes. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, look, nerve here because there are uh, part of the problem and one of the issues to be dealt with at COP twenty six was how to to try to get some no normality and some standardisation to all of these norm standards, legislations, sort of minimum standards, the ESG goals versus the UN set asides versus the restoration. Mm -hmm. They are. Oh, this is my phone. Sorry. Uh, there, there are there are so many sort of models and, and guidelines and to get one's arms around it is actually proving quite difficult. Uh, uh, especially with getting the money in the door. Like that's why I kept on harping on that. Uh, it, it's like an existential change to the way the world's going without serious funding. Now we all hear about the, the sea of the trillion dollars out there sitting in a bank account somewhere ready to be released, but when and how? And I've been devoting two years of my life well, and other stuff also to do with rhinoceros um, to, to figuring out these, these answers. And, and, and basically, yeah, so to answer your question, I did it in writing, but it's, it's terribly important to understand that some kind of agreed upon method or standards or um, it's, it's as important as anything else. And, and there's no actual silver bullet because on one hand, it depends on where the money's coming from. If there's ESG money coming in, then they want something for their money. Sure, they might not want to return on investment, but they want to see some kind of credit given or, you know, and, and how to get the arms around that. Uh, you know, to what, to what does the money answer to and how does the project answer to the money? It's, it's a problem that is, well, it's actually a problem needing a solution. And that's why uh, everybody is actually right. I mean, everybody can be right, uh, despite the fact that we're all different. And I think that's why coming at it from different angles is, is the way to do this in an integrated approach. So it's, it's kind of non-answer, um, which is why I kept the, my written answer short and my verbal answer long, which is what I often do. But I hope that helps some capacity. Thanks. Um, thanks, Samuel, for that. I would like to encourage all of the participants, if you still have additional questions, uh, please, feel, please feel free to just, to just add it to the Q&A. Um, I see one more question uh, that could be quite relevant, just uh, popping up here now, and we still have four minutes, so I'm gonna allow uh, this question from Mary Ralphs. Uh, apologies if this was asked yesterday, but in our experience, EIA processes are totally biased in favor of the developers. Sustainability is just a box to tick using unrealistic and unproven mitigation measures. Are there any of the organizations present directing any energy? Sorry. Um, directing any energy at addressing this. So this is a little bit open. It's not aimed specifically at anyone. Is there anyone that would like to, to take that? Well, I, I, I'll have a stab then, um, if, uh, Lawrence. Um, the, the issue there in terms of a snuck argument is that the EIA process is not supposed to be biased. Uh, as the, the, the process by definition is supposed to be independent. And, and that is really uh, uh, an issue in its own silo where the practitioners and the specialists must maybe also get their head around that we've got more power than we think. And, we should all stop trying to keep our jobs and start working together maybe to, again, unlock all this financing that's, that's kicking around. But at the same time, remember who we are, where we've come from, and we have to be independent. Uh, and maybe I've been you know, guilty of it in the past where I, I always think of a way to find a way, but sometimes there is no way and sometimes there is. So uh, the independence in itself is something that needs to be monitored to a much more stringent level. If that, if that uh, with my specialist hat on is able to is able to kick in as a sustainability you're 100 percent right this greenwashing 
has been around too long. The initial carbon credits, for example, had no verification of proof. And I think that's the cornerstone of, of my argument where verification becomes absolutely baked into the cake. If you can't prove what you're doing in a transparent method, uh, then you, then you, you, you don't got dinky do. And this is where we really must start to embrace technology uh, and apply it across the board, not just to stop birds getting chopped up, but to, to apply it in a, in a way that can prove positive impact. That's my two cents. Thank you. Thanks, Samuel, for, for taking that. Now, some of the questions are not always easy, but we can't ignore these, um, these questions. We can't just filter them out. That's why we have this forum and that's why we have this um, discussion. So thank you very much for, uh, for putting your hand up there. All right, everyone. Um, this brings us to the end of the morning session and the Q&A. We are bang on time. So thanks, everyone, for participating. I'm just going to share my screen again and take us back to the agenda. All right, we will now be moving to session two. Um, no breaks because we're doing it quite quickly. So uh, if you'd like to get up and have a quick little leg stretch, you are probably in the comfort of your own home, so you can do that. Um, so for session two, we will be starting off with John Smalley from Wild Skies chatting about successes and challenges with monitoring and mitigation at operational wind farms in South Africa. Um, we're looking forward to that. John has quite a lot of experiences with, uh, with pre and post construction monitoring. Then uh, Libby Hershen from BT Renewables will be chatting about observer led shutdown on demand. Uh, after Libby, Adam Jaworski and Luke uh, will be chatting about Biesco bird protection system, efficient and affordable bird protection at wind farms. I think uh, the word affordable there certainly uh, triggers uh, everyone and really makes me perk up because that's something that's quite, quite uh, important and required. And then the last session for the day by Dr. Christopher Mathieu from the Peregrine Fund, the potential for identity to reduce bird fatality. So this session then all about monitoring and mitigation. Um, I really hope we don't have another technical problem, but uh, if we do, please just bear with us. It just seems that it's Friday and the internet is on the blink. Um, so yeah, let's jump straight into it. Hi everyone. Sam has asked me to run through some of the successes and challenges with operational monitoring and mitigation at wind farms in South Africa. Just to give you a little context to my involvement, I'm an avifaunal specialist. My company Wild Skies has monitored 10 operational wind farms to date, with a combined total of about 26 wind farm years. Between the different sites, this has ranged from a minimum of one year to, at some sites, we're into our sixth year consecutively of monitoring. And these sites vary in size from seven to 60 turbines, and almost all of them are in the Eastern Cape. Most of these programs were joint bird and bat programs run with my bat partner and Kululeku Wildlife Services. And at these sites, we had carcass searching teams ranging from one to eight staff. I started trying to calculate how many kilometers these staff have walked over the years searching for birds and bats under turbines, and it became pretty impossible. But suffice to say that there are hundreds of thousands of kilometers walked and hundreds of pairs of boots worn out by these staff. And I would like to thank them for that hard work, which is normally um, pretty thankless and pretty boring. So I would like to recognize how much effort has gone into that. An overview of my presentation, there are two main sections to it, fatality monitoring at wind farms and mitigation at operational wind farms. And under that heading, I'm going to go specifically into on-site Cape Vulture food management, because that's been my experience so far. In terms of successes of fatality monitoring, there were some early claims made on social media during EIAs and some of the earlier project assessments that wind farms would just cover up bird fatalities. I haven't seen any evidence of that at all. I don't believe that's happened. So that's a real positive. 
bird fatalities, particularly of red listed species, are not good news for wind farms. But they, in my view, they front up and they deal with them. They don't cover them up. Based on experience at conferences and talking to colleagues around the world, it seems to me like much more monitoring effort has gone into wind farms in South Africa than elsewhere. Some other parts of the world have done a lot of work pre-construction, but they seem to fall off quite a lot in the operational phase. So I think that's really something we can be proud of. And almost all the wind farms I've worked with have shown a really solid commitment to monitoring and complying with best practice and the EA conditions. And several wind farms have gone well beyond those conditions. And there have been many op op opportunities for employment created and lives improved. In the first year or two of this monitoring in particular, we hired the carcass search teams ourselves. So we had first-hand experience of how those people's lives were changed through having solid, reliable employment at these wind farms. And that was really wonderful to see. Of course, there have been some challenges as well. The biggest one probably being interruptions to work. This is very boring and very hard work, walking under turbines day in and day out, Monday to Friday. And there are a lot of legitimate interruptions to this work based on bad weather and safety and that type of thing. But we've also seen that there are a lot of excuses made. So this is something that takes tight management at wind farms to try and eliminate. Where there are interruptions to searching schedules that translates into difficulties with our statistical analysis and um, the data quality is just not up to scratch if there are a lot of interruptions. So this is something that has to be tightly managed at all the sites. We have seen in some areas that there's been pressure put on wind farms by communities to hire certain people or hire from certain parts and there's even been protest action in some cases to, to block roads and um, stop fatality searching at wind farms. So to some extent the fatality searching programs have been caught up in what I think is, is some bigger community or political challenges that the wind farms experience. But this isn't good for our work either. It delays work and it creates um, problems with the data quality as I mentioned earlier. In some cases the landowners when we've started with fatality searches haven't been aware that we were going to have staff walking quite far from the turbines into the felt every day. So this is perhaps something that could be explained better early on in the agreement with landowners. And then the transition from carcass searches being employed by us as specialists to, being, to forming an SME or being employed by the wind farm has been quite challenging in most cases. Typically at wind farms in the first year or two, we hired the searches directly and then at some point uh, the wind farm requested to change the arrangement and create an SME for those searches. And that's obviously been a wonderful opportunity for them to get more than just a salary out of the equation, but it's also resulted in some challenges. It's a, it's a sudden transition um, from being a worker to being a director of a company and needing to manage the company. And there are a lot of skills there that need to be acquired very fast. And at the same time as doing that, the searchers need to still do their primary job of searching for dead birds and bats. So we have seen a bit of a challenge there. And there's been quite a big drop off in the data quality when that transition has happened. I think that there's some room for improvement in terms of supervision of the SMEs from the wind farm site. And certainly also in terms of business support. I know that the wind farms have programs for this and they have consultants mentoring these SMEs, but it seems to me like there's some room for improvement. It's quite a, a big ask to change people from, from being workers into business owners overnight. And I think there could, could be a lot more support for that in my view. And then we need to keep our focus on what the task is. So it seems to me that in some cases a higher priority has been to been given to giving to creating jobs than actually getting the job done. We've had cases where more staff have been hired than what is required. And while that's wonderful for job creation, it hasn't resulted in better work being done. It, bigger teams are harder to manage and there's less accountability and uh, staff members have to do less searching each per day, which then means um, there's a lot of 
unused time in the day. So it, it just doesn't seem to make sense to me to do that. I, I fully support job creation, but the job still needs to be done well. So we need to have a dual goal here of both job creation and getting the job done well. In terms of fatality mitigation successes, there have been some recent successes with observer-led shutdown on demand in South Africa and with blade painting overseas in Norway. And these are quite topical issues that I think others will be presenting on during this conference. In terms of challenges on fatality mitigation, we still don't know enough and we haven't tried enough, to be honest. There aren't enough wind farms that have implemented mitigation for birds so that we know what works and doesn't work. So the learning curve has been pretty slow to date, in my view. Some wind farms are not willing to implement anything that wasn't stipulated in the EA, but the early project EAs were often too vague. So we then in a catch-22 situation where nothing gets implemented. I'm not sure that there's always sufficient compliance enforcement from the national department. So I think that could probably be improved and discussed. And in general, implementation of mitigation is slow. It's a slow process. We're often told that it can't be done until the following budget year and then the budget deadline comes and goes and then it's delayed another year and so the wheel seems to turn quite slowly in terms of implementing mitigation. A key challenge with birds is deciding when to mitigate. Fatalities of particularly red listed species are rare events but events that have very high consequence. So they're not statistically significant, they're on patterns that can be detected and yet mitigation is important and it becomes very difficult to decide when to do that and also when I, when to stop I guess if if the mitigation has been effective I guess at some point there'd be a, a call for it to stop I haven't been in that situation yet though there often seems to be a language mismatch between operators and bird specialists as well engineers and, and financial managers are are used to dealing with definites and black and whites um, whereas in the bird world, we just can't give you that certainty. We can't say categorically when a bird will fly or where it will fly. They fly because they can and they fly where they can and when they can. But that doesn't mean that the, the need to mitigate is any less just because it's a bit of a gray area. Just to have a quick look at the Cape Vulture Food Management Program. Um, this is a mitigation measure specifically for Cape Vulture collision fatalities where we try to reduce food availability on site through finding dead animals before the vultures do and removing them. So I've been involved in three sites with programs like that and they've ranged from full-time teams searching for dead animals all day, every day, to the other end of the scale just being a general instruction put out to other on-site staff to keep their eyes open for dead animals. And obviously there's a range in effectiveness. The dedicated team is far more effective than, than an ad hoc instruction. The relationship with farmers is really key. Most wind farms would depend ultimately on the farmer to dispose of dead animals, particularly when it's big animals like cows. Uh, the wind farm site staff typically wouldn't be able to, to load it and move it off. Um, so we do depend on the farmers. At, at least one site, we've seen a positive effect, at least anecdotally, of, of a program like this. We had a number of vulture fatalities in the first year or two and then implemented this program and went for about two years without any fatalities. And the next vulture fatality actually happened during the COVID hard lockdown last year when the, the food management staff couldn't be on site anyway. The site was shut down. So we do think that there's a bit of an indication that this type of program can mitigate effectively to some extent. It's probably not the full mitigation on its own, but it can form part of a, a broader mitigation program for a site that's killing Cape vultures. And we've also seen that a collective approach can be very important. So if one wind farm is managing this effectively, but the neighboring wind farm is not, then the overall effect will be less positive for the birds. So to summarize the, the main points, um, I believe lots of excellent work has been done and, and great commitment shown by wind farm operators. In my view, there's been really good data transparency and no cover-ups. I think that South Africa has a world-leading operational monitoring effort in my view. 
And the creation of jobs is something that's been really positive and is really important. But I would like to emphasize that that shouldn't be at the cost of doing the job well. We have to achieve both goals. We cannot just tick the box that jobs were created and then not bother ourselves with how well the job was done. That's, that's not going to be good enough in this case. I also have seen that there's more support needed for the SMEs that are formed by fertility searches on wind farms. So I'd encourage the industry to discuss this a bit further and, and see how the efforts can be ramped up a little bit in that, in that regard. Perhaps more training and, and mentorship for those, those people at the sites. And I believe that the, the willingness of operating wind farms to mitigate effectively has an effect on the whole industry. So if operating wind farms cannot or will not mitigate effectively, it then puts new projects at jeopardy. So as specialists and as stakeholders, we would be forced to take a more cautious approach in EIA phases because it's not yet been proven that, that the impacts can be mitigated. So I think that the industry needs to be aware of this and um, certainly push the operating wind farms as far as possible to mitigate soon and mitigate effectively. Thanks very much. Hello everyone, my name is Libby Hirshon. I am the Sustainability Director at BT Renewables. I've been asked to talk about our observer-led shutdown on demand program that we're running across our platform. Um, so I thought I'd just start off by just giving you a quick overview of the of the program of the projects where we're running it. Um, but then because there's so much to talk about on each one, I thought I'd um, do a deep dive into um, the program we're running at Excelsior here in South Africa. Um, because that's the one we've been running for the, the longest, so I have most of the lessons learned on that one. Um, then I, and I'll tell you a little bit about the protocol we're running about there, about some of the components of the program, some of the lessons and the challenges that we've um, experienced there, um, and then a little bit of a look ahead and, and examination of, of the way forward on our programs. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, so we have committed to shut down on demand across all of our existing wind farms. Um, the, the one is Capito Energy. That's where we actually, the design of this program came into effect. Um, this is our 100 megawatt wind farm in Kajiado County in Kenya, where we've got 60 turbines. Uh, the, this, the design of the shutdown on demand program has been in the making for many years. Um, it's part of a broader um, net gain program that we're running with a, a huge focus on anti-poisoning. Um, so we have components that are on-site mitigation, so for, to ensure no net loss in priority species, but also we're doing extensive programs, conservation programs with NGO partners in Kenya um, for net gain in various species. So we have 31 um, monitors there led by a lead ornithologist and a deputy ornithologist at eight vantage points. Um, I won't go into more detail on that, but would love to talk about it any other time uh, because it's a very, very exciting uh, program with very interesting components. Um, then our second, our other project is the, our 32 megawatt wind farm in, in Swellendam. Um, we've been running shutdown on demand there since the 24th of December. Um, and so we've got a lot of, of lessons there. And that's, as I say, that's where we'll do a deep deep dive um, in for the rest of the presentation. Our other wind farm is Golden Valley. This is a 120 megawatt wind farm um, with uh, 48 turbines. We hadn't, uh, we didn't commit to shut down on demand from the start of operations. Uh, the main reason for that is because um, the critical habitat assessment that we ran, that we'd run at Capetto and Excelsior as well, showed that it wasn't critical habitat, unlike the other two. So there was no requirement for shutdown demand. However, we have since uh, undertaken a threshold analysis and seen that if we um, that, that, that if we strike a Cape vulture, who is one of our priority species there, then we are above the threshold. So we decided to take a proactive measure and we've started, we're going to be implementing a shutdown on demand program. So we're starting to put um, the measures in place like recruitment of monitors and building of vantage points, um, et cetera, to get that into place. Um, and that we're hoping to have in place by 
um, end of the first quarter or and at the latest by the middle of 2022. So going in a little bit more detail into Excelsior. So basically what happened was when, when we acquired um, uh, the project when it was in construction, we decided to take an under, undertake a critical habitat assessment due to our commitments to these kinds of assessments that are projects. And what this came out with was that um, we have five types of critical habitat qualifying species. Um, and those include the black harrier, the cape vulture, the blue crane, the gallus long-billed lark, and the rhinoster felt it, it, itself. Um, so we, so Chris Van Royen Consulting worked with us to develop a biodiversity action plan that addressed um, these as our priority species. Um, and there's two components of that. There's one which is um, the on-site mitigation aspect, which is where the shutdown on demand comes in. But we've also got a net gain aspect for each of these um, species, which, which is where we're working with a number of conservation partners to do conservation programs over and above what we're doing at site. So we've got, you know, some exciting initiatives there with um, with the Overberg and Osterfeld Conservation Trust, with the Fitzpatrick Institute, um, with Volpro, with the Endangered Wildlife Trust, um, amongst others. So very excited about that, but we won't go into that now because the focus here is shut down on demand. So just to say here that um, for in terms of uh, the species being incorporated in shutdown on demand. It's the black harrier and the cape vulture, but um, we also included the Varroa's eagle and the Marshall eagle because they were seen as occasional visitors to the site, and we certainly didn't want to exclude them from the shutdown um, program. So, what are the components of the shutdown on demand program? Um, so basically, we developed a protocol and everything's been designed uh, based on the protocol. Again, that was from an extensive process that we, we went through at Capetto and then adapted it to Excelsior. Um, we had worked with TVC, the biodiversity consultancy at Capetto, and then uh, TVC and Chris Van Royen worked uh, together to, to develop the appropriate program at Excelsior. Um, what this basically, the, the basic components are that we have a team of monitors um, that are stationed at vantage points. Um, the vantage points have a two kilometer coverage, essentially. So basically, we, uh, we Chris helped us to design the locations of the, the vantage points that meant that all the turbines were in sight. Um, so the monitors are placed there. Um, there's a certain protocol as to when a uh, a bird comes into the area. Um, when they're seen in the horizon, they're seen as in this yellow zone. When they're within two kilometers, they're in the orange zone. And then within one kilometer is the red zone. When they're in the red zone, that's a shutdown zone. So as soon as they get into the red zone, the um, monitor calls into the operations room. The operations room shuts down the relevant turbines. The monitor then observes the bird until they've passed through the risk area and then calls into the operations room and, um, and, and calls in to have the turbine started up again. Um, as part of this, there's quite strict protocols around the recording um, of not only the shutdowns, but any um, near misses um, and, and details of the, the bird and its flight um, that, that caused the shutdown or the near, near miss. So in practice, what does this actually require? So we had to increase our team of monitors who were doing the carcass monitoring um, to from five to 10 to allow for enough people to cover the vantage points in shifts. Um, we had to uh, ensure that we, there was an extra operator employed to cover um, the after hours and the holidays and the weekends, because obviously this is run uh, 24, well, seven days a week um, and there's no, days that it can't be run. Um, so we had to make sure we had the right resources. We had to build the vantage points. You see there, I absolutely love them. I think they're beautiful. Um, the, the vantage points that were built, um, also with the help of our specialists as to the design, um, we had to put in ablution facilities. We had to ensure we had enough vehicles because obviously these monitors are in shifts um, and have to be transported to and from the vantage points, um, etc. 
Um, and then we had to do a whole lot of training and capacity building um, because we um, incorporated this upfront during construction. We had the opportunity to train the monitors during, during the construction period um, and then to do practice implementation once the turbines were up um, and, and in the testing phase um, of the turbines. And then there's ongoing training both internally and by our specialists, which takes place quarterly. Um, and we also, we're lucky enough because we've got Capeto in Kenya, um, the two teams share learnings bi-weekly. There's a session where they should share learnings between each other and that's been exceptionally useful. What are the challenges associated with this program? Um, one of the biggest challenges has been communication between the monitors and the operators. Um, where especially in the beginning, there were quite a few teething problems in terms of communications, in terms of the priority which was placed on this, in terms of miscommunication, missed calls, etc. But um, I think we've smoothed that out and we haven't had any problems that, with that for a while. Um, also, the equipment itself, some of the walkie-talkies um, stopped working. Obviously, that has huge implications for continuation of the program. We also rely on WhatsApp and so mobile re receptivity, etc. So we've had to develop backup communication channels to ensure that the pro program continues working. Uh, another challenge is obviously um, the shift requirements, um, the changing daylight hours, and and the concerns around presence of birds in the in the uh, the daylight hours, and ensuring that our monitors are on shifts long enough to cover that. But then there's also the aspect of human fatigue, distraction, boredom, etc. So we've been looking at ways to change shifts in order to and also to pair up so that those um, so that those things can be avoided. Um, but it's a work in progress, certainly. Um, so what are our results to date? Uh, well, this is till the end of October. These results that we have had till the end of October, we had 133 shutdowns um, successfully. Um, 98 of these were for Cape Vulture and 33 for the Black Harrier. And then there was actually one quite early on in the program for a Varose Eagle that came in. It's they're very rare at Excelsior, but this one came in and was um, it was it was it was hunting in the area. Um, so we had a shutdown for that. And um, we're starting to see some really interesting trends arising from our data um, because we have quite a rigorous data um, collection and management. Uh, system. Um, and so some of the things we're starting to see is, for example, which turbines are being shut down the most. So where's the most activity? You'll see in the graph there that turbine 13 is shut down the most. I mean, turbine 9 is shut down the most, followed by turbine 13 and then turbine 1. Um, and then what we've started to notice is most of the, the shutdowns occur in the afternoon. Um, but obviously, over time, we'll see if these trends um, stay the same or if they if they change. Then unfortunately, so that our program was run highly successfully um, until the end of October. On the 5th of November, unfortunately, we had a Black Harrier collision. Um, the Black Harrier was found in the morning, the carcass was found in the morning and it was still warm, which means that it had happened recently. Um, the immediate uh, emergency procedure was kicked in. So what we do is we committed to, if there's a priority species collision, we see it basically the same as a fatality on site. So a human fatality on site. So we, we treat it the same. So we had instant uh, communication with our specialists, uh, with our management team. Um, and, um, and we then went to a root cause and an incident analysis which we did with the specialists. So working with Chris Van Royen and, and Albert, as well as um, we've been working closely with um, Rob Simmons and Odette from Overberg Renosterfeld Conservation Trust on monitoring the Black Harriers. We've actually contributed tags um, and have been working closely with them. So we contacted them immediately um, and we did both an internal and an external incident analysis. So what we found was that um, we looked at well, what are the root causes of this incident? Um, and one was around the placing of the turbine. So there's actually a, um, the, the monitor is required to, to, to look 360 degrees. So obviously that was, that's caused the challenge. 
Um, also, the vantage point is in a dip, so there's a blind spot to some of the turbines. Also, um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, there's erratic behavior of um, black harriers in hunting season. Um, and then obviously the factor of potential human fatigue or distraction. Um, and so we looked at all of those factors and, and then we examined, okay, well, for which, each of those factors, what are the potential mitigations that we can put in place? So in the short term, what we did was we have actually, uh, and we've worked with this with our specialists um, to look at, okay, well, you know, the placement of the, ter of the, of the vantage point, and we've actually found a better place for that that allows for um, a better vision without a blind spot. Um, we've also put two uh, monitors on instead of one on that particular um, uh, vantage point. Um, and um, we have looked at changing shifting um, so that that people so that there's not this potential for boredom and distraction. Um, and then obviously a lot of ongoing training. We also um, consulted with um, Robin Odette about potential medium to longer term mitigation, such as blade painting or curtailment. Um, and we are looking internally at the potential for some of those. But in the meantime, we really wanted to um, ensure that there were measures incorporated into the program to um, mitigate um, this happening again. So that's the summary of our program. Um, there's obviously so much more to it and there's so much more to our conservation measures that, that add to this that we'd love to talk about, but we'll stick here to um, shut on demand. Essentially, I think that um, what I'd like to say is we, despite our, the failings, which are, are the actual collisions, we do feel that this is as effective as a mitigation measure as we currently have options for at the moment. We're really, really proud of this program. We're really proud of our teams. Our, our teams are incredibly passionate about what they do and very dedicated and very dedicated to learning the lessons. Um, so we've really committed to, to learning from our mistakes and constantly in, improving the program. And through doing this with input from our specialists, from people who really know um, this territory and, and can advise us accordingly. Um, and we're always willing to take those learnings on board. Um, we really do encourage our other IPP, um, our other development um, colleagues to consider programs like this, but we're also very cognizant that there are challenges associated with this program, um, running a program like this. The first thing that I'd say is, if you're gonna do it, you have to do it properly. You have to do the full components of the program. You can't do a kind of sort of half implemented program. It has to be all or nothing. What that then means is quite a costly program to run. The, the greatest cost is the salary costs. Um, it's obviously not just the full-time salaries, but because you're doing shift work, you have overtime costs, you also have logistical costs, equipment costs, um, and, and all of the management time and, and effort that has to go into that, um, and all the coordination, etc. cetera. Um, I'd say in terms of, um, for future projects, I think my concern, and I think my colleague Rebecca will have touched on this in a previous uh, presentation. In terms of future projects, um, because this is a costly exercise, the concern is that you know, with, with tariffs rapidly decreasing, there's less cash to play with, essentially. So while we could work out a mechanism for um, running a program like this, um, the, the competitiveness of the industry and the decrease in the tariffs means that it's probably get, going to get more and more challenging for people to adopt and to take on. So just I think that that's just a consideration I wanted to, to raise. Um, and so, yeah, just to say that I think that we acknowledge that this isn't an 100 percent effective mitigation. Uh, but we feel that it is very effective. We have had failures and we've learned from it. Um, and we're really, really proud of, of this program and really willing to share any information. We're willing to take um, questions and comments and input. Um, and yeah, as I say, very proud of it. And um, yeah, welcome any questions and comments from the rest of you. Thank you very much.
We believe business and ecology don't have to be in contradiction. Biosecco allows safe production of green energy from the wind, preventing collisions between birds and wind turbines. The solution allows investors to avoid unnecessary costs. Biosecco system works best where regulations related to bird protection require the temporary shutdown of wind farms. The costs of its implementation are much lower than the possible losses caused by stopping production. And when the turbines run normally, the need for black energy is reduced. Bioseco, in harmony with nature. Hello, my name is Adam Jaworski and I am the CEO of Bioseco. Today I would like to present you the efficient and affordable bird protection for wind farms. We call it Bioseco BPS. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to present our system at Birds and Renewable Energy Forum. Let's start with the genesis. So, we all know what are the challenges of wind farm operators regarding bird protection. But let's sum up. The reduction of negative impact to the environment, getting along with the authorities, making sure that there is no black PR, and avoiding risk of financial penalties or extended turbine shutdowns. What could be the solution? The solution lies in technology. At Bioseco, we developed an efficient system that is saving birds and protecting investors. And why we think it's efficient and affordable, I will just show you. The main concept underlying our system is stereo vision. So instead of wool using one camera, we are using two cameras working in parallel. What is the advantage? Is that we can estimate the distance and classify the size of the bird in real time. That allows us to use strobe deterrence, audio deterrence or turbine stop depending on the distance of the bird to the turbine. And also we are able to say whether it's a large bird or a small bird and that can also impact the number of turbine stops. The technology was developed for the last five years and it, we keep upgrading this. I would like to share with you the detection efficiency testing for red kite. This is a typical bird that collides in Europe uh, with wingspan of roughly 1.5 meter. 2019, we tested it in Germany in a, a federal, federal research program. And the results were that 97% of red kites were detected in the range of 200 meters, some 80% in the range of 300 meters. And we registered 7% of false positives. We developed the system and last year we tested another version uh, at the wind farm of largest Polish wind energy operator, PGE. Using better equipment, we were able to achieve better results. 100% detection efficiency in the range of 400 meters and 80% in the range of up to 500 meters from the turbine with only 5% false positive rate. Both of those systems are all, already on the market. We didn't stop because in some wind farms and in some countries, we are seeing that there is an increasing demand for extended detection efficiency. So we, des we designed and we are testing right now BPS long range. The first verification results are showing that we are able to spot red kites in 100% in the range of up to 700 meters with false positive rate below 5%. This system is not ready on sale. We need to finish the testing and then we are expecting it to be on the market by mid-2022. But you could ask why we are giving so much effort, putting so much effort into developing the system, increasing the number of cameras, and increasing the resolution and processing power. This is because we know that it's very important for the wind farm operator to have an accurate system, both to have the very efficient bird protection, but also not to stop the turbine for unnecessary reasons. So one of them could be false positives. That's why 
where we keep introducing new elements of artificial intelligence and upgrading the ones that we already have in order to reduce the number of false positives, which can impact heavily on your operations and on your income due to unnecessary stops. And another thing is also that, as I said, our system allows the size classification. And we are seeing that majority of birds across wind farms we are operating are rather small birds than large ones. Whereas in Europe, the biggest focus is actually placed on the birds that are in excess of 1.2 meters in wingspan, such as kites, eagles, vultures, storks. And therefore, we believe that our system has the advantage over one camera systems because we are able to distinguish between small birds and large birds. And at the same time, we are also able to estimate the distance. It is very important for us that the client has full access to the data that is recorded by the system. So not only you will have the register of all of the detections, the register of whether the turbine was stopped or not, you will also get the flight route estimation, the estimation of the distance and the estimation of the altitude. Also, you will get the access to the video that was recorded by the system that you can verify whether if the turbine was stopped, it was stopped for the good reason. In this case, I would like to show you a movie that was recorded by one of our system standard version in Spain in July this year when a vulture was flying around the turbine, but it never crossed the level of 300 meters, so it was far away. In this case, the, tur the turbine was not stopped because the authorities agreed with the operator that the distance the safe distance is 300 meters. So above 300 meters, the turbine should not be stopped. But the thing is that our system was able to trace the bird in real time and decide whether the turbine stop is necessary. Yet here we have another case. It's also Spain. It's, it's again a large bird on quite a dense wind farm you can see that this bird is coming closer to this wind turbine where the system is placed. And in this particular uh, case, we would we stop the turbine in order to make sure that there is limited collision risk. But you would also ask, okay, how, how does it look from, from the side, from the side of an observer? In this case, this is a quite recent recording that was made by our technicians in France uh, in October, when you can see that's a red kite I told you about. Uh, it's coming close to a Gamasa turbine. In this particular case, the distance threshold is 200 meters. If the bird comes closer, the turbine should be stopped, and the turbine was stopped in this case, and the bird could fly away. A bit about the installation method, so it's non-invasive, it takes one day, we need two mobile lifts. We are doing, we are using steel clamps or magnets, depending on the structure of the tower. Uh, we don't need rope access, we need regular power, um, and we are executing the SCADA connection by Modbus or OPC. We are a young company, we are two, two for two years our systems were in the market, but Despite of that, we are already present in Poland, Germany, France, and Spain. We are operating with, uh, on wind farms of some of the global players like EDP, Axiona Energia. We are also working with regionals like WPO or Beva RE, uh, DISA in Tenerife. Our systems are operating on Enercons, Vestas, Gamesa, Alstom, uh, Axiona Wind Power, and by the end of the year, we'll have the first installations also on GE turbines. Last but not least, I have to mention that this project of R&D was financed, co-financed by European Union. And uh, what is also important and might be interesting to you, we have a partner in South Africa. His name is Lux Stragnell. So in case you have inquiries, you can directly approach him. Or you could contact me also uh, if you have any doubts about our system. And we are looking forward to having uh, some projects together uh, in South Africa. Thank you very much for your attention. All right.
Uh, thanks everyone for, for zooming into my talk. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, my name is Chris McClure, and today I'll be talking about the potential for Identiflight to redu reduce bird fatalities at, at wind, wind power facilities. So wind energy uh, is, uh, it kills birds and it's especially uh, bad for raptors because they're long-lived species and, and they, their populations rely on a high level of uh, adult survival. And in the U.S., uh, raptors, or at least bald and golden eagles, are uh, a, a special concern because they are protected by the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. So uh, wind farms could get in a lot of trouble if they're killing more eagles than they are permitted to be killing. So uh, some uh, wind farms in the uh, United States and uh, I guess around the world have implemented uh, a process called informed curtailment. It's usually done by by human observers, and uh, and this is a process where human observers are constantly scanning the skies, looking for raptors, and if they deem a, a raptor to be at particular risk of collision, they will order a given turbine to be shut down in real time. And it, it usually um, takes about 20 seconds to shut down a given turbine. But there is a new machine uh, system called uh, Identiflight. It's an aerial detection system, and we have been working at a uh, wind power facility in Wyoming, USA, uh, right there, and uh, that, that's what I'm going to be talking about today is, is uh, our work in Wyoming. <clears throat> so Identiflight is uh, a series of cameras, basically. This is a, a, a picture of one Identiflight unit, and the way it works is it's got eight wide uh, view cameras around uh, sort of the bottom there. And those cameras are constantly aimed up at the sky and they're searching for any, uh, any flying objects, any movement. If uh, the unit detects something moving, then it will uh, move its stereo camera. That stereo camera is on a pan and tilt uh, system. And so it can move around and look at anything, any flying objects. Uh, that happen to be going by. And so uh, because it's a stereo camera, it can judge the distance to the object and it can judge whether or not, uh, whether it is an eagle. So there's uh, pictures taken by Identiflight of bald and the golden eagle, whether it is not an eagle. So these are not eagles. Uh, so we were, uh, we were given a grant by the American Wind Wildlife Institute to test the, uh, the efficacy of humans versus uh, the machines versus identified uh, units. And so we pitted them against each other and we found that during our test, the humans detected 1,224 birds, which I thought was pretty good. But it turns out the machines detected 7,182 birds. Uh, this is a big difference. And it shows that the, uh, the identified units are indeed better at seeing uh, and detecting birds than, uh, than humans are. And so we also tested whether or not they were correctly classifying uh, eagles and non-eagles. So this graph shows the probability of a correct identification if the bird is truly an eagle. And you can see identified is much better at recognizing eagles, whereas uh, humans are more likely to mistakenly call something, uh, call an eagle something other than an eagle, like a turkey vulture or a red-tailed hawk. But when the bird is not actually an eagle, uh, identified is more likely to mistakenly think that it is, uh, which honestly is fine by me from a conservation standpoint, because identified would probably s uh, save uh, more eagles because it's more likely to recognize them and it's probably going to save a few turkey vultures when it screws up and, and thinks they're eagles. So we published this, uh, this work in biological conservation and uh, uh, this was sort of a preliminary uh, test to see whether or not, uh, you, you know, whether or not the uh, identified units were more efficacious than uh, than human observers. And so this wind farm that we were working at, it's called Top of the World Wind, wind Power Facility in uh, Wyoming, uh, went all in on Identiflight. So here, here's the location again. They installed lots of Identiflight units to, co to uh, cover all of their turbines, all 110 turbines at this facility. And uh, the way that it works is uh, it's got a curtailment algorithm. This is a diagram of, of the algorithm that they, uh, that they 
presented. And so the orange square there is the rotor swept zone. The, it's not square. The orange cylinder there is the uh, rotor swept zone. The middle cylinder, the smallest black one, uh, if a bird ever enters that cylinder, then the turbine is automatically shut down no matter what uh, direction the bird is heading. And if the bird uh, enters the outer cylinder, then shutdown is determined by a time of collision threshold. And that's usually about 10 seconds. So if the unit determines that the uh, the bird will, the bird that is that it thinks is an eagle will um, will fly into the rotor swept zone within 10 seconds usually, then it will shut down the, uh, the wind turbine. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, they went all in on IdentiFlight. And so they did that uh, in, in 2018. And so you can see this is uh, the number of turbines covered by IdentiFlight. So they did it in sort of a staggered fashion. And here, uh, what we're looking at, uh, see that gray line down there at the bottom? That's the number of curtailments up until uh, 2018 uh, when the IdentiFlight uh, was, uh, was implemented. And uh, the, uh, you can see there's not that many curtailments being ordered by the humans. The humans were ordering the, the curtailments at that point. But once IdentiFlight uh, is put in charge of the curtailments, they skyrocket. Um, IdentiFlight began ordering way more uh, curtailments than the, the humans did. Uh, again, this is because it's detecting more birds and it's more likely to detect a bird as an eagle than a human would, or to classify it as an eagle anyway. So this gives us uh, a before and an after time period that we can test uh, IdentiFlight's efficacy. And, uh, and we also have a nearby control site. So uh, here we're looking at a map. The, the, the eastern uh, area there is top of the world wind power facility. And so here it's showing the IdentiFlight units. Uh, are, so the wind turbines in uh, top of the world are in orange and the IdentiFlight units are in black. And you can see that the uh, the identify units are dispersed throughout the um, throughout the wind farm, and then we have a top, uh, sorry Campbell Hill wind power facility is over to uh, to the west, and you can see its wind turbines are in blue, and it never received identify units, and it was never being curtailed. So uh, what we have is a control and a treatment site, and these two sites are roughly 15 kilometers away. from so for analysis, uh, we corrected for carcass persistence rates and searcher efficiencies, and we used uh, evidence of absence software, uh, which was created by the U.S. Geological Survey. So some results. Uh, so for eagle, the fatality rates of bald and golden eagles together, this, uh, this shows the, uh, the rates of the control site during the before period, and it actually uh, went up a bit during the after period of the control site. So uh, here are the results at the treatment site. So this is the site that received IdentiFlight during the before period. It was much more deadly than the, uh, the control site. But during the after period, it actually dropped. So the two uh, sites basically swapped in their positioning. And this is an 85% difference in, in the fatality rate. So this, uh, what we found was IdentiFlight did indeed uh, drop the fatality rate of bald and golden eagles at this wind power facility. We can also look at this uh, yearly. We don't have to just look at it in, in before and after terms. And so you'll notice that uh, in terms of yearly fatality rates, the um, control site was uh, during the before period was always better or at least less deadly to eagles than the treatment site. And uh, the, the two sites sort of changed in concert, uh, going from, uh, from, one time, uh, from one year to the next. Uh, they sort of rose and fell together. So this shows that our treatment site and our uh, control site are fairly comparable uh, in terms of eagle fatalities. But uh, you'll notice that bar in 2018, uh, that, that gray bar, that is uh, the time period in which IdentiFlight was being implemented. And so that's, uh, we don't count, we didn't uh, calculate during that time period. But after IdentiFlight was fully implemented, you'll notice that the two uh, sites, even though the treatment site had always been worse in terms of fatalities than the control site, they swapped. And after IdentiFlight was, uh, was installed, the, the treatment site became the safer of the two sites. 
Uh, so we published this these uh, results in uh, Journal of Applied Ecology, and we've got a lot of feedback. And so uh, we've incorporated that feedback. We've rerun the analyses. We've added new data, and the results are basically the same. The, the control site and the treatment site basically swap after identiflight uh, was implemented. So we have another paper in review right now. So some considerations uh, that we need to think about uh, in terms of the efficacy of identiflight is, uh, yes, it does seem to, uh, to lower uh, eco fatalities, at least at our site, uh, at least at the uh, top of the world in Wyoming. But uh, what is the cost? Uh, they won't tell me. Uh, I don't know how much the units actually cost. Uh, and so, and so, uh, so that's the question I always get. So I'm going to head that off right now. I don't know how much. Uh, it costs to install identifiable units, but it's um, not cheap. I'm told. Uh, there's also curtailment costs. So remember, curtailment skyrocketed after um, uh, identified was installed. And so, again, I don't know how much that costs the wind power facility um, in terms of both lost uh, energy and wear and tear on the turbines. Uh, they don't tell me these things. Uh, but in terms of efficacy, it does seem to work at, at top of the world. It's uh, there are no published estimates of whether or not it works elsewhere, but uh, I'm being told uh, it's being tested at Montana uh, and uh, in, in California and at Altamont Pass, also in California. It's also installed in places in Germany and Australia, but I have no idea how well it's working there. Uh, but there's there's definitely room for improvement here, especially in terms of the false positive uh, moment rates. Um, and uh, so uh, identify, you can change the identification, the classification uh, of, of the units and, and uh, change the, the algorithm that it uses. And supposedly it, it keeps getting better and better. So uh, maybe it's uh, gotten better since we tested it. And you can change the, uh, the curtailment algorithm. So you can let birds come closer uh, without shutting it down, so you have fewer curtailments um, if you have a higher risk tolerance for uh, collisions. And that's basically my talk. Uh, we worked with a lot of different folks, and uh, I should mention uh, before I wrap up here that Identify did partially fund some of this study, so take that however you want. Whether you consider that a conflict of interest or not, I guess it's up to you. And uh, with that, I appreciate everyone uh, zooming into my talk. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you to all the presenters for that. I think uh, went very well, no glitches at all, most interesting content. So we have a little bit of time for questions. So I'm just gonna run quickly to the Q and A uh, and sorry if your question is not uh, been answered. Some, I see many of the questions been answered directly, but uh, we are a little bit short on time. So I'm gonna jump straight into it. Uh, this one is for Libby from Andrew Pearson. Uh, he's asking, was your SOD program at Excelsior planned and funded before being bid, uh, con before bid construction? When was planning done and funding set aside for it? I think that's a question that more than one person would like to answer to. Libby, if you could help us out there. Sure, thanks, Lawrence. Um, thanks for the question, Andrew. Um, so we didn't... So because we actually fired the project when it was in construction, uh, well, we'd, yeah, it, 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 we hadn't planned for this. Um, so um, it wasn't pre-planned for um, in terms of the costing. Um, I think, and this is why I wanted to answer it live, because it's, it's quite a key considering in consideration in terms of project, future projects and costings, I think. Um, it, it relates a lot to the to the design of the REAP program, um, and um, in the in the round that we bid in, it required high levels of employment. So the ability for us to fund this was easier because we um, had anticipated high levels of employment. Um, so we felt it was a very very good um, kind of win win. Um, so the additional employment costs were not significant in relation to if you were starting from the beginning in terms of employment costs. So that's where that came in. But I just wanted to mention that because it, it, it relates to the question around, um, you know, conservation measures and, and the ability to, for wind farms to be able to 
take part in additional conservation programs and mitigations moving forward, that I think the design of the REAP program and, um, and some of the issues around that, that's been discussed previously on, you know, utilizing the EDACD program, whatever, like really feeds into this. Um, and in my view, and I just wanted to have the opportunity here to say, you know, we, there is this very, very rigorous requirement around EDACD and massive penalties to the IPPs if they don't comply with EDACD spend requirements. Um, and the question is, why isn't there a similar requirement around environment in the IPP program, especially when there are these ma massive impacts on birds? If there was a specific requirement, then it would level the playing field for wind farms and would would then enable um, uh, developers to really take part in these conservation programs. So just wanted to add that to my response. All right, perfect. Thanks, Libby. There's another question for you. I think it's uh, pertaining to the turbines specifically. Serena so Lowry is asking the turbines 1, 9, 10, 11, and 13, were they initially identified during the EIA to be in a high risk zone? Does the findings of the pre-construction monitoring align with the data obtained during the STOD? I, my honest answer is I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't think so. I don't think that the pre-construction monitoring was that as specific as that. But I mean, I could I could put the question to Chris. I don't know if Chris is on here, Chris Monroy, and I think he did the pre he's did the pre-construction monitoring. I actually don't know what the answer is to the question. Sorry. I think what happens in many cases, um, Serena, if you're still online, is that if those turbines are in fact identified as high risk, then they get moved, uh, you know, to new areas that we perceive as being a lower risk. And, um, you know, then it's technically hard to say, are they still high risk? But of course, um, you know, in, in practice and over a 20 year period, there's a lot that can change. So thanks for that, Libby. We might come back to you in a second. Uh, I have another question from Mark Huerta. He is asking just generally about wind turbine technology and if alternatives are being considered. So this question is for Sawia. My understanding is that vertical axis turbines have a much, much reduced risk of collision and mortality. Many times, many sites seem better suited to, to um, vertical axis turbines as opposed to the massive tall structures and can deliver comparable power over similar areas, although at slightly higher densities. Uh, is there anyone from Sevilla that can possibly uh, answer this? Rebecca, thank you. Thanks, Lawrence. I, I'm not going to say I can answer it 100%. It would probably be better aimed at uh, members in the either the technical working group. But in my short discussions, I mean, we're always looking at new and innovative technologies um, out there. Um, just my understanding and very, very short is that the vertical axis turbines are less um, efficient than, than the, your standard typical three blade um, turbines. Not to say that they are completely, um, you know, uh, no go options, um, just that the yeah your typical three blade turbine currently at the moment is able to get a greater um, efficiency and effectiveness outcome than the vertical axis turbines. But again, I I you know probably a question we could pose to some of the members in the technical working group just to get a clearer answer on that. And at the end of the day, you're obviously looking for for. Yeah, your 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 best sort of production estimates. So, I think if you put them side by side on production estimates, my guess is that your three blade turbines are going to be far more higher producing, energy wise. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. I actually have limited understanding, but my understanding is the same. The other thing that we we shouldn't forget about when talking about higher densities. Um, bearing in mind that when wind energy facilities are retrofitted in future and can produce uh, improved outputs that we're actually going to sit with a situation of lower densities. Um, but high densities means more connectivity. And if those power lines again aren't underground, then it just, it just turns into a web uh, of uh, possible collisions for birds as well with power lines and also electrocution 
opportunities. So thank you, thank you for answering that tough question. Um, I'm going to jump to a question that uh, has been answered, but I think it will benefit the forum. Um, and it is about shutdown demand, and uh, because we've seen so many presentations about mitigation as well. Uh, Libby, I know that you're online. Would you mind answering, answering this question live for us again? Uh, it's from Simon. He's asking, could you comment generally about the scale of power loss from shutdown compared with other costs? Example, funding the shutdown team. Now, you've practically done this, and I suppose this is why I'm asking you the question, um, because it's not just hearsay or thumb sucking. You're in the, in the position. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think as I wrote there, we've been very pleasantly surprised. Um, the uh, power losses have been a lot lower than we had anticipated. Um, we're not relying on that yet because we are, we do feel it's very <clears throat> early days in the program and we acknowledge there's going to be seasonality. There's might, you know, there might be, I mean, in Kenya, for example, we haven't um, been through the sort of migration season of many of the migratory birds that come uh, through the area. Um, so we don't know yet, um, but just to say it's a, the, the, the power loss, um, the loss in revenue as a result of loss in power is a, it was a small percentage of the costs associated with actually running the program. Okay. That's great news. I think that's the answer that everyone wanted to hear. Would you like to add to that? Uh, sorry, Lawrence, just to say, I do have, think, and you guys will, you guys as the specialists will know this better than me, um, it will really depend on what species you have in the area, you know, what resident raptors you have in the area, you know, and, and again, the seasonality. Um, so I don't think that can, that's necessarily applicable to all wind farms. But so far, I would assume that generally the lower, the lower impact is probably applicable, but it would be, obviously there needs to be flexibility in what that means. Yeah. No, I think it's it's understood that uh, it will differ from site to site. I think um, we're just happy to hear some positive impact because it's always, uh, well, historically, it's one of the reasons uh, stated for not uh, deploying this technology or this um, or this option as mitigation because there are fears of of production loss and 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 of course their power purchase agreements and and all of those things that need to be considered. So thank you very much for for answering that. Um, with that, I'd just like to ask the, um, uh, the speakers if there are any open questions, if they wouldn't mind answering that in the chat, because we are actually at the end of um, our allocated time. Uh, I think it was great. I think a lot of uh, good presentations came out of this, and I just want to thank everyone for participating. Uh, you really make the forum possible. I think, again, just to state record attendance, so really happy about that. And um, yeah, we should have contact details uh, up for the for the presenters if anyone wants to reach out. And once again, the presentations have been recorded and will be available on the BirdLife, BirdLife South Africa website. So thank you all for attending and uh, have a wonderful day.